All right, everybody, get ready, because today we're going headfirst into a topic that's both fascinating and a little bit spooky. Definitely a bit spooky. We're talking about the undead. Oh, yeah. Specifically, we're going to be looking at skeletons and mummies and how these figures pop up across different cultures in some pretty interesting ways. It's really amazing when you start to dig into it, you know, yeah. how these figures tied up with death and the macabre, just they show up again and again throughout history. Like a universal language of spooky, right? Yeah, I like that. But first, let's start with the classic. Skeletons. Bare bones, literally. Just picture a skeleton. Yeah, right? yeah. It instantly makes you think like, okay, something's not quite right here. It's true. That skeletal form, totally stripped of flesh and life, that's been a powerful symbol of mortality for centuries, especially in Western culture. Yeah, like think about the Grim Reaper. Oh, classic. The black cloak, the scythe, ready to collect souls. Not exactly who you want to bump into on the street. Definitely not someone you want to grab coffee with. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the Grim Reaper, that whole image really gained traction back in the Middle Ages. It became like a visual reminder that, hey, death comes for us all. Exactly. It's that inevitability of death, just staring you in the face. But, you know, it's not all doom and gloom when it comes to skeletons. Mm -hmm. Think about how Mexico celebrates the Day of the Dead. You've got these colorful skeletons everywhere, all dressed up like La Calavera Katrina. Now that's a celebration. It's amazing how a culture can take something that's usually considered scary and turn it into this symbol of life and remembrance and partying. It's not about fearing death, but about accepting it as a part of life and honoring those who have passed on. It just goes to show you how differently cultures can view the same basic image. We see it with skeletons and well, we'll get to mummies in a bit. But speaking of different cultural spins on skeletons, have you ever heard of the Mekurabi from Japan? Oh, yeah, the Mekurabi. What do you think about when you hear that word? Well, it's a bit more on the unsettling side of skeletons. Oh, yeah. It's basically a skull, just a skull rolling around, but it's got eyeballs. I'm, oh, yeah, see? Not so festive. Oh, not as much. Okay, so we've talked about skeletons. They can be spooky, sometimes festive, but always fascinating. Now, let's shift gears over to their less bony counterparts, mummies. And I'm guessing we're not just talking about the wrapped up guys in museums. Exactly, we're talking about the undead mummy, you know, the reanimated kind. And what's interesting is that those early mummy stories, particularly in 19th century literature, often depicted female mummies in a romantic way. Oh, really? Yeah, a far cry from the terrifying creatures we usually see in movies these days. That's a good point. I wonder what brought about that change. Me too. Like, there's this one story by Théophile Gautier called The Mummy's Foot, where it's, well, it's about a disembodied Egyptian princess. She's just looking for her lost foot. And the main character finds himself in this very strange kind of supernatural love triangle. A love triangle with a disembodied mummy princess. You should read it. It's actually quite good. But it makes you wonder... Why were people back then so into the idea of a romantic mummy, especially a female mummy? It seems a bit odd now, don't you think? I think it reflects the times back then, you know? Like, in the 19th century, Europe was fascinated with what they called the Orient. And that fascination, it often showed up in art and literature, but it wasn't always presented in the most respectful way. Those early mummy stories, they said a lot more about the anxieties and fantasies of the people writing them than the cultures they were supposedly about. It's a good reminder that we should always be aware of how we approach stories about other cultures, past and present. It's about respect and understanding. Absolutely. Our perceptions of mummies have definitely changed since those early romantic tales. They've gone through a bit of a makeover. Oh, for sure. By the 1930s, Hollywood had discovered that mummies could make some money, and the romantic aspect, well, that was quickly abandoned for something a bit more... More marketable. Yeah, marketable. And thus began the era of the monster mummy. Cue the spooky music. Exactly. And no one represents that shift better than Boris Karloff in the 1932 classic The Mummy. He really set the standard for how we picture mummies, even today. He did. He really did. The tragic monster, driven by desire for revenge, wrapped in bandages. Talk about a makeover. Right. Talk about a makeover. But we'll dive deeper into that transformation in our next part and discuss where mummies stand in pop culture today. Oh, yeah. We've got a lot more to unpack. Karloff's performance, it really did change how we see mummies, even now. It's like, he made the mummy this tragic figure, you know, misunderstood, but still terrifying. Totally, and vengeful. Don't forget vengeful. Oh, right, of course. Vengeful, out to get revenge or reclaim what was lost. He nailed that feeling. One performance, and it just stuck with us all these years. 
But it wasn't all Karloff, right? Like in the 1930s, monster movies were huge, and mummies, they found their place in that world. It really did. And those early special effects, all jerky movements and dramatic shadows, pure nightmare fuel. Oh, definitely. So much cheesiness, but it worked. No, it really did. But where do mummies fit in today? We still see them in movies and books, but they're kind of stuck between, like, terrifying monsters and romantic figures. Yeah, it's a weird mix, right? You've got your action adventure stuff, like those mummy movies with Brendan Fraser. Mummies are the big bad, gotta stop them from destroying the world. Right, right. But then there's this whole other side where the romantic mummy is making a comeback. Hold on, wait. Romantic mummies are back. Tell me more. They are. It started back in the late 20th century. Authors like Anne Rice, she's known for vampire stories, right? Well, she wrote The Mummy or Ramses the Damned. Let me tell you, there's some serious romance going on under those bandages. Okay, I am here for the return of the romantic mummy. It's a classic for a reason. Cursed King, Forbidden Love, maybe a quest for some ancient artifact. Uh -huh. Help me in. But, you know, we've been digging deep into skeletons and mummies, but you mentioned some other figures from mythology who were kind of lumped into this undead category. Ah, you mean like the Draugr and Vrykalakas? Those names don't exactly scream Hollywood blockbuster, but I'm intrigued. What kind of creatures are we talking about? All right, well, imagine this. The harsh, unforgiving landscape of Norse mythology, right? Now, picture a reanimated corpse, often described as bloated and bluish, guarding a treasure-filled burial mound. But here's the thing. They're not like those mindless zombies you see in movies. Draugrs are smart, driven by greed and revenge. They're deeply connected to the land, you know. Okay, so vengeful zombies with a thing for gold. That's oh. a new one. So basically like skeletal Vikings with a serious hoarding problem. Not exactly skeletal. The image of the Draugr is more tied to how the corpse actually looks. But you're right, they're often linked to Vikings and guarding those burial mounds full of treasure. And what makes them truly terrifying is they're linked to nature's power. They can mess with the weather, make you sick, even shapeshift into animals, often appearing as a seal, but with human eyes. A seal with human eyes. You know what, I'm suddenly feeling a lot less adventurous about exploring mythology. That's nightmare material right there. And these aren't just scary stories, you know? The Drog appear in some of the most famous Icelandic sagas, like Grettir's saga. The hero, Grettir the Strong, he has a run-in with a particularly nasty Drog named Glamour. Glamour. Okay, so we've got a vengeful, shape-shifting zombie with a cool name and a bad attitude. What's next on our Undead World Tour? From the icy lands of Norse mythology, let's head south to Greece, where we find the Vrykalakas. Vrykalakas. Try saying that five times fast. All right, so we're trading in our Viking helmets for togas, but what about these Vrykalakas, another kind of zombie? They're often compared to vampires, but with some key differences. Vampires, they want blood, right? Vrykalakas, they crave human flesh, especially livers. They have a thing for livers. Okay, so maybe not the best dinner guest, but whether it's blood or livers, I'm sensing a trend here. Don't invite the undead to dinner, unless you've got a really big salad, just in case. Probably good advice. You want to know what else sets Rikolakas apart from, say, your average vampire? Absolutely. Lay it on me. They're described as bloated, with a ruddy complexion. Not your typical pale, gaunt vampire, right? And they get up to all sorts of mischief. Poltergeist-like stuff, spreading diseases. Imagine, you're at home, hear a knock on the door, and standing there, it's Rikolakas calling your name. If it were me... I'd probably invite it in for tea and the tickets. But something tells me that wouldn't end well. Let's just say, according to legend, answering that door. Really, really bad idea. <laughs> like, you might turn into a Vrykalaka is kind of bad. Yikes. Okay, so not the friendly neighbor type. Yeah. Starting to think maybe the best way to deal with the undead is just, you know, avoid eye contact and hope for the best. Well, the ancient Greeks, they were a bit more proactive. They believed that to stop someone from becoming a Vrykalakas, you had to pin their body down, often with nails through their hands and feet. Talk about a morbid to-do list. Yeah. But it really makes you think, doesn't it? What is it about these creatures? Skeletons, mummies, dragger, Vrykalakas, they all freak us out, but we're so drawn to them. I know, right? Nailing someone down to stop him from coming back as a Vrykalakas. Extreme. Yeah. But you're right. These stories, even the crazy ones, really make you think, why are we so into these creatures? Mm. They scare us, but we can't get enough of them. It's a question for the ages, isn't it? And there's no simple answer. Part of it, I think, is our basic fear of the unknown. What happens after we die? It's a big question mark, right? And these stories, even the fantastical ones, they're a way to explore that fear, to give a face, a shape to the stuff that scares us. So we're trying to understand death, even if it involves flesh-eating creatures and a hankering for human livers. 
Exactly. But it's not just fear. There's also a sense of wonder in these stories. They offer us these glimpses into different ways of seeing the world, different belief systems. Like, think about the Draugr again. Their connection to nature, their power over it. That suggests a worldview where the line between living and dead, natural and supernatural, it's blurry. It's a reminder that there are still mysteries out there. Yeah. Things we don't fully grasp. Exactly. It's like, maybe our modern way of thinking so focused on science and logic, maybe it doesn't capture everything. Right. Like, maybe there's more to life and death than we currently understand. Maybe so. And let's not forget the pure entertainment factor. These stories, with their creepy settings, those larger-than-life characters, they're a great escape from everyday life. It's a safe thrill, a little shiver of fear, all from the comfort of your couch. That's so true. There's nothing like a good ghost story, especially when you know you've got all the lights on and maybe a spare clove of garlic handy. Just in Exactly. So next time you find yourself drawn into a story about a skeleton guarding some ancient treasure or a lovesick mummy, remember, it's not just spooky fun. These stories offer us a glimpse into something bigger, something we all share. Our fears, our hopes, our endless fascination with what happens after the lights go out. Well said. And on that note, folks, we've come to the end of our deep dive into the world of skeletons, mummies, and the creatures that go bump in the night. We hope you enjoyed this journey into the spooky side of things and maybe learned a thing or two about how cultures around the world deal with the idea of the undead. And hey, whether you find these stories scary, intriguing, or a little bit of both, they remind us that even in death, there are stories to be told. Until next time, keep exploring, keep asking questions, and if you hear a knock at the door late at night, well, maybe just let the answering machine handle it.